Cura, and thanks for watching today's session, which is the last one for this quarter. Um, as you know, this one has been pre-recorded uh, due to some time zone differences, so there isn't a live chat. But thanks to those who sent through questions ahead of time. Uh, that aside, I'm absolutely delighted today to introduce Randy Commissar, uh, Silicon Valley investor, attorney, executive and author. So welcome, Randy. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you, Guy. It's a pleasure. Great stuff. Well, let's dive straight in. I've got a heap of questions and I'm sure we'll talk about lots of different things. Um, so let's start just by a bit of an intro. Tell us about yourself, your, your career path and how you got where you are today. Yeah, let me let me do it in reverse a little bit. So mm -hmm. I, you know, what I've been doing for the last 15, 20 years now, almost almost 20 years, uh, I've been a venture capitalist. I've been working as a general partner at Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield and Byers, now Kleiner Perkins, one of the original venture capital firms in Silicon Valley. And my specialty there was working with early stage talent and ideas with a very hands on approach. And mm. so uh, it's an approach that I came up with when I was doing something just prior to that called virtual CEOing. And for about a decade, I had been given the moniker in the Valley as being the virtual CEO. I had <laughs> been coming in and running a portfolio of businesses side by side with the entrepreneurs. I had come up with a model where rather than displacing the entrepreneurs and coming in to run the business, I was able to sort of provide them with my experience and my network and my counsel and elevate them in their roles uh, as we develop their businesses. And that worked quite well. We did a couple of companies that may or may or may not know in the Valley, TiVo, Web TV, that were in the entertainment space. Um, so that model is the model that I ended up practicing as ven in venture capital for the last almost 20 years mm. as well. Yeah. Uh, in between, I taught at Stanford. I taught entrepreneurship at Stanford after I'd written a book called The Monk and the Riddle, which had been well received here in Silicon Valley as a as a parable about the the soul and heart of entrepreneurship. I went on to write two other books here in Silicon Valley, one called Getting to Plan B. I wrote that with Professor John Mullins of the London School of Business. And then I wrote one um, actually inspired by my trips to New Zealand called <laughs> Uh, Straight Talk for Startups, which is 100 very short chapters on things that entrepreneurs need to know before they start uh, in the, the process of raising venture capital and trying to build a business. Hmm. But before all of that, I <laughs> ran companies. So I, I ran LucasArts Entertainment for George Lucas. I ran wow. Crystal Dynamics, which was a game company that uh, Kleiner Perkins had. And I was a co-founder of a company called um, Claris, which was a spin out of Apple. Uh, where I had been senior counsel for a number of years. I was an attorney. I'm a trained attorney. I had worked in technology both on the East Coast and West Coast here. Um, and, uh, and, and I also was a CFO. I was a CFO of a company called Gold Corporation. So I had a number of roles in early startups as an executive. I then moved on to this virtual CEO role, working to develop both talent and ideas, and then went on to become an investor, but a very hands-on investor uh, and also a teacher. Great, great. So along that massive journey, which has obviously been huge, and uh, we, we've just, I, I assume, just heard the, the key sound bites from it, a long and uh, rich career so far. What, some of the learning experiences you had on that journey, you had to make a lot of decisions. Uh, I, it's clear that it was also emergent, the process. It wasn't pre-planned as none of these things are. So what are some of the inflection points, learning experiences you, ha you had along the way that framed the path you took? Big question, I know, but maybe a few examples. I think it's a really great question, I, and I, I get that, asked that question by my students all the time, mm. right? Um, you know, they're at that takeoff point in their, in their lives. They're trying to figure out what to do next, um, and most of them overthink it. And I will tell you, I was, I was just like them when I was starting out. Um, but my career path only makes sense in the rearview mirror. Uh, it, <laughs> yeah. wasn't, it was directionless. And it was, it was, but it was, it was uh, anchored in a couple of key principles. Mm, great. And that was, I always optimized around the people I got to work with. It was very important for me to work with people who I shared values with, who I admired, who I believed I could learn from, who I could trust, and who I felt I could be a good team member with. Mm. And that was key every single time. It was very important who I was working with. The second thing was what I was working on. It was also very important that whatever I worked on was um was integral to my values, 
and was something that I believed that was really worth doing. In fact, I've the statement I now use is don't do anything that's not worth failing at. Mm-hmm. If success yeah. is the only uh, is the only reason that you are pursuing a certain path, given the uncertainty of any path, then it is generally not enough. You've like got that. to choose a path mm-hmm. and an option that where failure is a possibility and doesn't make you feel like you've wasted your time or energy, that it's actually progressed you along your path. That's critical as well. You're very nice. So, and the third thing is, um, always try to optimize your downstream opportunities. And what I mean by that is, um, it's like a billiards player. It's not good enough just to sink the ball. You want to set up the next shot. And so it's really important to choose areas of opportunity that are expanding rather than contracting. And as an example, I'll tell you, when I graduated from law school, I had been a, um, a, a junior rock promoter before going to, to, <laughs> to law school. And I thought I was going to be in the music business. I thought I was going to be an agent. But when I, when I graduated from law school, it became clear to me that while there were opportunities in the music business, they were pretty well defined. They were legacy opportunities. But the business that was opening up was the tech business. There were two long-haired guys on the cover. I think it was Time Magazine. I think it was Wozniak and Jobs. And they were my age. And they were out in California. And I looked at that picture and I said, I'm going west. (laughs) And I literally left the East Coast, went west. And that was a very important, um, I think, decision for me because in technology, I had opportunities that were unforeseeable. Whereas in music, it was going to be a fairly defined set of career choices. Yeah, yeah, that great, great lessons for us all. I think you know the the, the students listening in, but I'm learning from that as well. Thank you, Randy. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so I think I think you know we can see there's a lot of energy, and I think that's probably an additional one. The energy um, that makes you want to get out of bed every morning and, and start a day and just push push it on. And you've clearly got tons of energy. So tell us a bit about what what drives and excites you. I mean, what what is it that gets you out of bed every day? Uh, you know, again, and, I, and I'll use the music as an analogy because mm. the young people, I think, oftentimes um, look at entertainment and content and think that that's where their that's where their muse is. Mm. And I did the same thing. I mean, music to me in the '60s and '70s in America, it was a it was culturally defining, and I thought that's where my muse was. Mm. But it became clear to me as I abstracted from music that where my real interest was in, was in creativity mm-hmm. in all forms whether it was in business, whether it was in the arts, whether it was in, um, you know, in, in education, wherever it could occur, I was interested. I was interested in creating, not consuming. I was interested in, as, as, uh, um, you know, as is often said, the creative friction of, of creative destruction yeah. and the idea that you destroy the past to create something better in the future. These are really important principles for me. It took me a while to figure out that it wasn't a thing. It wasn't music. It wasn't movies. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, entertainment. It was creativity in general. So that really got me excited. And the more it became clear to me that creativity in any form was energizing, mm-hmm. the easier it became for me to find opportunities that were creative. The second thing was people. Okay. You know, yep. I really, really like to work as part of a team. Um, I felt very lonely as a CEO. Frankly, I didn't enjoy the job. It's a very difficult job to do because as much as you build a team and lead a team, you are alone in leading that team. And I was much more in, energized when I was part of a team, when I was a partner to the CEO. And so being able to choose great people and to help them to achieve their potential, mm. that also really energizes me so those two things are the things that get me up every morning and get me excited fantastic and i definitely want to get onto the topic of um different environments different systems and different sort of ecosystems of collaboration teammanship and leadership as well so i'll i'll i want to pick up on that a little bit later on as well because that's very interesting area to explore with you um so let's turn to some of the sort of the, the, the business mindset, the entrepreneurial mindset within within business broadly. So a, a sort of high level view um, with your combined consultant, virtual CEO, uh, attorney, and investor hat on. Um, you know what 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 is your overall business thesis? Whether that be your investment thesis or your your business decision strategic thesis. What 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 is it? I mean, if you could sum it up in you know uh, a few minutes, what might it be? I know that's hard, but 
in I, no, no, no. Actually, it's a really good question. Yeah. I have a chapter in, in um, uh, Straight Talk for Startups yeah. on the different approaches to being an investor. And I think about being an investor beyond putting in money, but putting in your time and effort, where you're going to work. And, and so, you know, in Silicon Valley and the venture capital community sort of falls neatly into a couple of categories, right? There's, there's people who invest in themes, right? Yeah. They have a particular idea of where the future is. That's where they're looking. You know, I, I call that looking for your keys under the lights, right? You're looking in a particular area for the opportunity set. Um, there, there are investors who have domain expertise, who invest in that domain expertise, meaning that they come from a background, they have certain insights into an area, and they want to take part in revitalizing that area that they know well and in reinvent that and they invest in their, their time and energy and money and those sorts of things. Mm. There's the there's the quants, the people who are able to look at now with the internet very early information and data around adoption and usage of things and they try to invest in trends. There are people who invest in financial data and accounting and forecasting. Those mm. are the growth investors, people who will take trajectories and invest in what they think those trajectories are, but they have a lot of financial performance data to work with. Um, I'm not any of those. Mm. I invest in people. You know, I, you know I, I, I tell people that when they ask me what I do every day, what I tend to do is I tend to sit across the table with a cup of coffee listening to some lunatic <laughs> describe a future that I can't even imagine and then having to decide whether I want to go on an adventure with this lunatic. <laughs> nice. Like God, yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, and so it's, it's the most fun job in the world. It's complicated. It's really a people job. It's about trying to evaluate what makes that person tick, what makes their vision um, legitimate or um, credible. And, um, and then whether or not I can actually help them achieve that vision and accomplish their potential. So I am a people investor. Yeah. I invest in people who bring me amazing ideas that I could never think of where I can add value to helping them achieve that. And the character of those people, the motivation of those people, the integrity of those people is paramount to my getting involved. That, that sounds great. I, I love that. So flipping it over onto the other side, if, if um, you were or giving advice to or if you were 20 years earlier in your career and you were wanting to develop a new technology, um, you had an idea, it was spinning out of a university or you know, out of someone's garage maybe, but they're looking at, at scaling up and developing that, getting some investment for it. What, what, would, what should they be focusing on? To, 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 sit in front of a, to sit in front of you at a table and, and tell you a good story that is compelling for you? So, you know, when I started in the entrepreneurship business, the innovation business here in Silicon Valley in the 1970s, hmm. uh, and when I became more serious about and disciplined about that process in the 80s and 90s, I had a, a long laundry list of things that I would look at to try to to discipline my analysis and my decision making. And I felt like I could outsmart the problem. I felt like if the, the, the more experience I had, the longer that list would get, the better I would be able to sort of spin that algorithm into making the right choices. And instead, what I have found for the last 30 years here is that in fact, that list gets shorter every year. Hmm. Um, there are fewer things that I actually try to analyze, realizing that um, my involvement at the very earliest stage of building these new ventures involves very little information or data and a lot of intuition and instinct. And as a result, one of the things that I now really insist upon mm. when I sit down across the table from a, um, a, a, an ambitious young entrepreneur is I want to know why. And, mm -hmm. what, and, yeah. and when I say why, there are three whys that really matter to me. Mm -hmm. Why are they doing this? Mm. Why are they the right person to do this? And why is it the right time to do this? Yep. Those three questions um, create a dialogue. They instigate, catalyze a dialogue mm. where you can get at almost everything else you need to know, mm. right? If you focus on, start off with those three questions, 
why this, why you, why now? Mm -hmm. You can answer those questions in a um, sincere and genuine way. And I can see the merit in that. That's the beginning of a relationship. I like that. I like that because often we typically teach or typically communicate the idea of um, whether it be through a sort of entrepreneurial process of effectuation. But we often talk about the solution problem couple. What's the solution? What's the what's the problem? How do they marry together? And then we move on to, well, what's the market? And those are, I guess, the traditional investor questions we see on TV or we read about in a lot of the textbooks. So so your suggestion is that you'll get there. You'll get to those points yes. if you if you ask those founding questions. Yeah. Exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. It's not that those questions are relevant. So, when when uh, when I co-wrote um, with with Professor Mullins the Getting to Plan B book, mm. Getting to Plan B is a book that basically says that business plans, by and large, aren't successful at the earliest stage. Mm. Meaning that we went down and anecdotally looked at a number of very successful startups in the Valley and found that almost all of them had succeeded on it with a business plan that wasn't their original business plan. Right, yeah. And some of them had to go through 9, 10, 11 business plans before they ultimately got to a successful business. And so getting to plan B um, postulates that if that's the case, then how do you think about planning a business at the earliest stage? And how do you build a learning thinking organization to be able to get to the right answers yeah. where by asking the right questions. Yeah. And, and in that process, one of the things that we wrestled with a lot was what is the value of any business plan when somebody walks in with their initial idea without a product, without a market? With the and, and the notion being that if you turn out to be successful with a business plan that you've created, Without a business, without a market, without a customer, without a competitor, without a dollar in sales, then you're lucky, not smart, because <laughs> you don't have enough data to be smart, right? Yes. Yeah. So what's the process? And and what we what we postulate in that book was the process is one of empiricization. It, you've got to basically be going out and experimenting, testing core assumptions quickly and arriving at a refinement of your thesis and assumptions as you go through this process. So the important thing in there is to consider is that people would come to me after reading that book and go, and they would sit down and tell me their great idea and then look at me and say, are you interested? And I would say to them, where's your business plan? And they would say to me, but you're the guy who wrote, you don't need a business plan. <laughs> I said, you misread the book. I didn't say you don't need a business plan. I said, I don't believe your business plan, <laughs> but I need to see it. And the reason I need to see it is I need to see how you think. I need to see what your core assumptions are. I need to see how you react when I test them. I need to see your best thinking. And the lingo frank of that is a business plan. I love that. That is that is just beautiful. That is just beautiful. It helps put into context why you go through a business planning process. It's not just simply putting together a document because you've ticked a box then. It's about going through the process of thinking about it, challenging yourself, um, and then exactly. and, and then and then writing something that captures all that and allowing it to be challenged. So I think that's a really nice way of positioning what these documents are for. Um, you know, we talk about that a lot, don't we? We talk about the fact it is experimentation, it is effectuation, it is constant learning, which begs the question, do we want a static report? Well, a business plan can be a living document, can't it, as well, oh, do, you, do you think? Yeah. Totally. Mm. Totally. In fact, in, in getting to plan B, one of the things we recommend is that you, you use a, a series of, um, of, of straw man sort of uh, uh, dashboards. Mm. And these dashboards start off with your core assumptions around technology. They then, as you refine those through testing and analysis, they become questions about your market. They become questions about your value proposition. They become questions about your distribution. And at the end of all those questions, which can take a few years, you have a business plan. Yeah. It has be it is an empirical business plan designed around the core learnings in your business. I love that. That is that is wonderful. That is wonderful. Um, so let's think about that. So we were talking a little bit there around um, what 
smaller startups need to do. How, how does that thinking, and I think I think it does, and I think you'll agree, and I think you'll you'll you'll, you'll extend this thinking. How does that apply then when you, you you've scaled up and you're now working yeah. with Lucas Arts, a big 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 organisation? Um, yeah. How does that thinking then apply to that larger, more scaled context? Well, you know, it gets harder to innovate when you're a large company. And, yeah. I, and in Silicon Valley for you know, 30 years, we'd have these safaris mm. of these large, you know, Fortune 100 companies coming through the valley all the time, trying to learn how to be innovators. Mm. Right? And I will tell you, my discussions with them were always kind of interesting because while they we're trying to incorporate mm. the move fast and break three things kind of philosophy of very, very early stage startups. Yeah. They were taking into consideration the fact that they were always innovating. Mm. They were innovating in a very incremental way and innovating around value proposition and customer distribution and customer analysis and identification, all the things that big companies can do well, but they weren't valuing those. And the reality is that a big company really can't afford to innovate in a, a move fast and break things sort of way. Mm. They have customers, they have balance sheets, they have P, they have P&Ls, they have investors, sometimes public investors. They can't afford to break things. Yeah. And so they need to think about innovation differently. And one of the things I always tell these guys when they come through, because usually it's the CEO and the CFO who's sitting in the back corner, basically, with his arms crossed. Because <laughs> just really stuff, you know, and then they're head of engineering and they're head of marketing. And they come in and I, and I and after the CEO makes this great preamble about how they want to become a Silicon Valley style innovator. I turn to, to the head of marketing. I go, if you fail, do you get a promotion? And I yeah. turn to the guy running R and D, and I say, "If you're, if you make a, a wrong bet, are you given more resources?" And they look at me and go, like I'm crazy, and I go, "Well, then you can't innovate, like like a like a first stage startup. You can't because in a in corporate America, there is no ability to reward failure, and failure is critical to innovative success." There is no alternative but to stare failure in the face. And that's, by the way, I'm not saying you should plan on failing. I'm saying you should expect to fail, yep. right? Yep. Plan to succeed, expect to fail, and figure out how through failure you can fail forward. Brilliant. This is something that is um, really a uh, privilege of very early stage privately financed small enterprises, hmm. not big ones. Big ones have, I think, do a better job of identifying technologies that can be disruptive to them and their industries, to pulling them into their organizations, to figure out how to operate with them successfully, and incorporate their DNA, and do that methodically. You watch what, what Microsoft's trying to do with OpenAI right now, hmm. pulling in their technologies. Whether they'll be successful, I don't know, but certainly um, the artificial intelligence of ChatGPT could not have been developed at Microsoft. Right. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So, so thinking then about those larger firms, um, that they, there's things they shouldn't do or ways they shouldn't think. They can't pretend that they have an entrepreneurial mindset in the same way as a, as a nimble, fast startup, of course. So, what what advice would you give them to actually set up a new innovation team such that it might work within that organizational framing? Just so, some top so, level thoughts. You know, usually I diagram this, but I'll try and illustrate it. Okay. Um, so remember, I, I, I had the CEO in the room, I had the, the VP of engineering, and I have the VP of marketing. And the, CFO, the CFO is in the back with his arms crossed, mm. looking <laughs> I love that scene. There's a reason yeah. for that, right? Mm. There's a reason for that. And here's the reason, here's the gap that needs to be closed. See, uh, that CFO is essentially running a billion dollar a year business. Yeah. They have an R&D budget of a hundred million dollars. They've got 10 different R&D projects to $10 million each going on. Mm. Um, at some point, a couple, one of them walks for, forward and says, it's working. Yeah. I can see this happening. You know, the CEO looks at it and goes, this is exciting. We're able to innovate inside our own organization. The VP of marketing begins to put together plans 
And the CFO comes in and says, great, when will you be in market? <laughs> I'll be in market in five years. Oh, and um, how long will it take you to build a $100 million business? Oh, well, it'll take me another five. Well, it's just 10 years from now. And the CFO turns to the CEO and goes, you want me to give this guy another $50 million when in fact, they're not going to make a dent in our billion dollar business for a decade. And it's a gamble. I could take that 50 million and I could, and I could hire, I don't know, I could hire 50 more salespeople, right? Or, or invest it just in bonds and make more money, maybe. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. exactly. And so this is the gap. Yeah. They're investing in that early stage innovation and they've got this big, you know, aircraft carrier of a business. In between, there's a financing gap. Yeah. And the CFO can't, for the life of them, it's not the CFO's problem, it's a business problem. The business leaders can't, for the life of them, see how they can afford to trade dollars from that big business into the small business when it has such a long shot and long term payout. That's what you've got to figure out how to do if you're going to be a disruptive innovator as a large company, is, is to bridge that gap. Brilliant. I love that. That's great advice. Um, it resonates with me and my own experiences as well, working with um, larger organizations. Um, I think next time I meet one of those larger organizations, I might invite you into the room to kind of cut through some of the, uh, <laughs> so, some of the discussion because those points are just spot on, I think. Thank you so much. Um, so let's, let's turn away for a short period of time from Silicon Valley and, and, and the sort of uh, US centric and, and the more international stuff. And, and I know you're also doing some great work here in New Zealand. Um, you're obviously an executive in residence here at the business school, which is absolutely wonderful to have your experience. Um, but on that side, but also more broadly, you, you've had you commented on the New Zealand um, innovation entrepreneurial ecosystem as well. So can you tell us a bit about your role with the University of Auckland and also then a bit about your views on New Zealand as a, as a, as a, as a, a target for investment and innovation? So let me tell you what I'm doing there. Why Great, am I super. There? Yep. So um, in the first instance, I've got a very, very good friend of mine, long-term friend of mine who emigrated to uh, from the United States and Canada, actually, to New Zealand over a decade ago, hmm. uh, ex-Apple um, uh, executive, um, dear friend who invited me over many, many years ago just to enjoy the scenery. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and as, as he is wont to do, he decided to try to, to to reel me in a bit by introducing me to a number of his friends who were at Spark and uh, and at Air New Zealand and at Ice House and at the Angel Association and you name it. He he wanted me to meet them and I did. Um, I met some people at the university as well. Um, and uh, I, Jeff Jeff Witcher uh, Witcher. Um, he was some, one of the people that I oh yes at the university. yes yes wonderful guy. He was a great guy. Yeah. Uh, so what I found was in those discussions that there was a lot of curiosity and interest uh, in New Zealand around how to build an innovation economy. Mm. And I found that my experience was really useful. And interesting enough, not my experience of Silicon Valley today, mm. but my experience of Silicon Valley in the 1980s and 90s. Okay. And the reason was that bears a lot more resemblance to what's going on in New Zealand than the huge cap of private equity capital market that, it, that characterizes venture capital today. So those discussions went well. I felt like I could be helpful just through my experience. Um, and at the same time, the US market had been changing on me. As I said, I'd been involved in the startup world for decades here. Mm. But around 2008, right around the, the time of the last crash here um, before the, 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 the recent COVID crash, post-COVID crash, um, the market for venture capital innovation changed in Silicon Valley. Yep. Um, and I think a lot of the world didn't recognize it, but it was very clear to me what was happening. And that was that because global interest rates were really low, more and more money was moving into early stage high risk opportunities mm. in order to juice returns for hedge funds, pension funds, the you name it. They they were not be were not being able to get their long term returns out of more conservative investments in public equities and 
fixed assets. Yep. So that money flooded in. And when that money flooded in, it changed the complexion of venture capital in Silicon Valley. Venture capital in Silicon Valley for decades had been a sort of a cottage industry of entrepreneurs investing in entrepreneurs, right? People had success. They wanted to see that success throughout the or- throughout the Bay Area in new and um, in creative ways. They would raise funds, invest in people like themselves, help them build businesses, and you ended up with this virtuous cycle. Right around 2008 to about, well, the present, Silicon Valley became, instead of entrepreneurs investing in entrepreneurs, they became a financial exercise. Hmm. They, people participating looked more like the same people you would see running hedge funds oh, rather yeah. than running companies. Yeah. And as a result, you began to see venture investing differently. It was, became a numbers game. Yeah. It became a large check game. So rather than smaller checks with high multiples, people began to try to invest billions of dollars into startups in order to put that money to work that was piling in from the outside. And it became the Wall Street of early private equity. Mm. So with that mindset change, the the entrepreneur was no longer the product. They're, they were no longer the, the, um, the, the, the customer. <laughs> they yes. were suddenly, the customer was the investor. Yeah. And that really felt wrong to me. It was just not the way that I, you know, as I said, I'm attracted yeah. to talent and creativity. Yeah. That was, um, that was being lost in this process. Yeah. So, to put it in context, yeah. I began to look for new models of how to build innovation hubs remotely from Silicon Valley, where you could keep the best and brightest in their um, in their uh, economies, contributing to their societies, and you could scale according to the size of the economy that you were building your innovation in. Yeah. And so I began to look for places to practice that, to try these things. I looked in Europe, I looked in South A- Southeast Asia, and I looked in New Zealand. New Zealand, to me, offered a very, very um, highly skilled talent base. It offered a great, great infrastructure in terms of dig- a digital infrastructure. Mm. Uh, it offered a sophistication, a global sophistication in their economy and a desire and a hunger to be able to innovate. Yeah. And so I decided to come to spend more time in New Zealand to be able to help New Zealand build New Zealand's own innovation economy. One that, um, that, that really characterized and expressed New Zealand Kiwi values and was designed around the competitive attributes of New Zealand. And that's how I came to New Zealand and why I'm practicing it. That's great. So, so what, what are your, some of your activities on the, on the ground here, or, or virtually, you know, um, yeah. business school, but also more broadly? Let's, let's hear about that. Yeah, so let's talk about all of that. So, great, so, yeah. Um, one of the things that I made very clear when I got to New Zealand was I was not going to be an investor. And there's a reason for that. And I basically said, look, if I'm going to be an honest broker in the process of bringing together and catalyzing the various pieces that you need to build a successful innovation hub, if I'm going to be that honest broker, you've got to trust my um, decisions and choices. Yeah. And you've got to trust my counsel. And I can't have you second guessing that. Yeah. So for the time being, for the time being, I'm not an investor. I will not take an economic stake in this success. I yeah. will be a good a good faith catalyst for helping you build this. So, so that was the first. So, so to, just just on that point, that's kind of going back, I guess, to reflect on your experiences in Silicon Valley during those the the eighties, where um, the customer was the investor and the entrepreneur was the tradable asset almost. Totally. Yeah. So you're moving totally. moving back and, and stepping away from it. Totally. I'm not an investor means you're escaping that kind of loop. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly yeah. Right. yeah. Mm. So, so I started by, by, at that time, you know, when I got involved, the, 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 most of the um, capital was coming from yep. actually 
the angel community. So I got involved with the Angel Association. Um, I, uh, I still am a advisor to Suze Reynolds there at the Angel Association. I, I then became um, a board advisor to, um, uh, to Movec. Mm. So on the institutional side of venture capital and also to Nuance in the new um, venture capital community that, uh, you know, it's a very recent fund focusing on hard tech. Yep. So I became a board advisor to those investors. That's the investor community. I then also, I had a small role in helping to sell the government on the New Zealand Growth Capital Partners Fund, Fund of Funds. And I then became a strategic advisor to them. Oh, great. And deployed that money yep. in the industry. Mm. Um, I, uh, and, and I uh, I've started to work as an executive in residence at the university for a very particular reason. And that was when I was out helping to evangelize the New Zealand Growth Capital Partners Fund, when I was evangelizing that, um, $300 million that was um, led by the government and super to put money into the institutional innovation capital funds. Um, I said, you know, $300 million is great. It's a per, you know, get us really started. We'll fill the gap that was there when I got there, which was there wasn't a lot of follow-on capital. But I said, I have never seen a great innovation hub without a great university. And I said, the thing that we need to do is we need to invest more at the university, not just in teaching entrepreneurship, but in developing the PhDs and technology that will give New Zealand competitive advantages to become a global leader mm, absolutely. from a small island and small economy in the middle of the Pacific. And so the university has to be part of these discussions. We have to figure out how to get those great PhD students and professors developing that technology. Mm. We have to have a process of where we vet and discuss where we want to invest that money, but we can't avoid that because if we don't have a great university, we won't have the firepower to build the competitive boats that we need for New Zealand to build a successful innovation I, I could not agree more, absolutely. I wholeheartedly agree. And there's so many of us at the university who really support that mission. Thanks for supporting us on that journey. Um, that, that, that's great. Um, I think we've highlighted some of the differences between Silicon Valley and, and, and New Zealand, so that's great. So I'd like to move on um, to the next question I've got here, um, which kind of builds on that. So I'd like to talk about it in the global context, the Silicon Valley context, but also maybe focusing a little bit more on where New Zealand as this potential hub, this nascent hub that can explode internationally with the right kind of messaging and the right kind of kind of, kind of development. What, what are the key trends? I mean, we're hearing all the time about, about new things that are shaping the world technologically, economically, politically. We've got sustainability, climate crisis associated with that. We've got the utopian and dystopian views of artificial intelligence. You know, what, 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 what's, what's the future to you? How do you see it changing things? And what's New Zealand's place in that? And I appreciate those are three incredibly broad questions, but it's an invitation and open to the floor to, 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 have your, to, to hear your comments. Well, they're questions I think about a lot. Yeah. And I, I debate a lot. Even mm. when I was there in April, I was debating, I found myself debating it many times. Mm. Because there is a view in New Zealand that you need to just plant many flowers and see which ones bloom. Mm. My sense is you don't have the time or resources to do that. Mm. That you've got to have to make hard choices. And you're going to have to pick those areas that are both um, big global problems mm. that you have unique perspectives and talent to solve and that you can um, participate as a leader in from you know the middle of the Pacific. Yeah. And so those three things have to define how we consider the areas for investment, time, energy, research, development, um, investment, everything in, in, in New Zealand, meaning we got to make some hard choices. And I do believe that New Zealand Inc. has some big competitive advantages, mm -hmm. has a great brand of sustainability. I know when we're there, we can debate all day long. Is it as green? Is it as good as it, as it says it is? Probably not, but it's better than every place else. Mm. So that gives it a competitive advantage, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it's small size, and it's, I think, very responsive and, um, um, and responsible 
government yep. allows you to move quickly in areas that are important, like aerospace. Mm. There's no reason why you know aerospace is finding um, a, a home in New Zealand, other than the fact that it is a very comfortable place to do business, mm. and the government has risen to the ta- to the task of making that happen. So there's a competitive advantage, right? Yeah. Um, I don't believe, for instance, that you know SaaS or crypto are areas of competitive advantage mm-hmm. for New Zealand. And first of all, SaaS is not an area of innovation. SaaS is a business model. We shouldn't confuse it. And the reason that venture capitalists like SaaS is because it's a paint by numbers area, right. right? They run ratios, they run the numbers, they feel good about their decision. The reality is that SaaS is not a product or a service, it's a business model, and it can't define the competitive long-term opportunities for New Zealand. So sustainability, agritech, yes, you are some of the, you know, you, you are some of the most um, responsible and successful agriculturists on the planet. You know, supplying, I think, for something like, I don't know, 40 million people with, with milk products on a, you know, on a, mm. on a, at a daily basis. Yeah. That's a pretty remarkable thing for, you know, an island of 5 million people. So the reality is that, that, that there's places for us there. Um, I was just had a discussion, you know, uh, 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 Dylan Lawrence and his team um, and, um, and, 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 um, and Mark Vivian from Movac were just here visiting me a couple of weeks ago, and we were uh, talking about uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Okay, great. And yeah. artificial intelligence is fascinating to me mm. because um, my friends in artificial intelligence tend to be fairly old school. The people who were building artificial intelligence technologies and companies thirty years ago. Mm. And I will tell you, as of the beginning of this year, my discussions with them, which we'd have over coffee regularly, was artificial intelligence is overblown. It's still 20 or 30 years off. And, you know, we can't get carried away with it by the hype. By the time I got back from New Zealand in April, I'd been there in March. I got back in April. How I got back in April and sat down with these guys after ChatGPT had come out, they were ashen. Mm. They looked at me and said, my God, I don't know what's just happened, yeah. but the world has fundamentally changed. Mm-hmm. And I think the important, the, the important um, truth there, and this is a debate that still goes on, there's almost a mysticism among the tech community about what's going on in the ghost of the machine yeah. in artificial intelligence. I don't share that mysticism. I, I believe it's science. But I do believe that what has happened is remarkable that we have somehow crossed a threshold in big data and compute power that allows the machine to do something with all the data information that we have given it, which is immense, that we had never been seen before and that we have never been able to do without the machine. Mm. And that, to me, is um, is what's impressing people. It's leaving sort of the media breathless. The mm. media generally it's, doesn't get it. I mean, they're not technical people. They are they are carried away with this. I think they should be ignored. Yes. But by and large, when I look at this, there's one thing that's quite clear to me is artificial intelligence is the next platform, right? Yeah. You know, is it the first? You know, if we look back historically, the platforms have been you know the PC. The, the 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 application software the internet uh e-commerce social um and uh and now it is this next big platform that will be the leap forward in new ventures is artificial intelligence and when i was sitting with mark and with dylan we were talking about what does that mean for 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 new zealand i mean new zealand is not going to compete with open ai they're not going to compete with google they're not going to compete with microsoft in developing the next big plot scale platform for you know natural language artificial intelligence but i don't think that's the only place to play that's where the that i think is what's mesmerizing people today but the reality is artificial intelligence is everywhere machine learning is operating and what we need to do is think about in every new venture how machine learning can transform what they're doing and how they're going to be able to um to, to, to take advantage of the new technologies and applications to apply to their solutions, to their databases, to their information sets, to be able to take advantage of what machines can now do. Great, I like that as well. And it leads to an, another question, I think. Um, 
I, I know that the future has always been uncertain, but otherwise it would not be the future. Um, <laughs> um, I get a sense, though, the opportunities of things like AI, um, the fact that visions are potentially overblown in certain settings like the media and confusing, which drives imaginaries of the future that investors, developers pick up on, of course. I mean, the media always drives a certain sense of those things. Um, so in some ways, there is uncertainty. Um, there is um, popularism and um, um, new realities, alternative realities and truths that are being discussed and debated due to the political environment that we've had recently. Um, so the future is probably more uncertain in terms of actually how we can pick up on those things, in terms of how we can in some ways uh, future cast those sorts of things. Um, so you talk about how we can leverage AI, how we can understand how to apply it in a way that you know really innovates and, 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 and builds the value of New Zealand in the global, global context. So two questions. How do you manage that uncertainty and, and those unique vagaries of the future? How do you make decisions in, fa in the face of them? And, and also, you know, for, for our students, um, what, what kind of new skills can we be honing and developing? Again, really, really broad, tough questions, but any thoughts you've got? Well, uncertainty, of course, as you point out, um, is characteristic of all aspects of business, whether mm. you're a big company or a small company. Big companies yeah. live with immense uncertainties every day if you're a bank it's interest rates and if you if you do it wrong you're svb and out of business right mm. um but i do i do feel the pain here because mm. whenever there's a platform shift yeah whether again the pc the internet whenever there's a platform shift the level of uncertainty is becomes extraordinary yeah and navigating that takes you you, you can't tell where the destination is anymore mm. it's too far what yeah. you've got to do instead is be very clear on where your rudder is mm. and be very clear on where you're moving right now, where your field of vision is, what you know and what you don't know, and moving through that with a level of discipline and rigor that allows you both to question the, um, the certainty of that route as more information becomes available to you, but also to be able to change course in the process. And so you've got to build in the ambiguity in any design that you've got at this point. Okay. And you've got to be able to, to um, accept the fact that you will make, have to make changes in the process. And, um, and you know, I do think that if, you, if this platform is like all the other platforms, what you'll see is um, a, a huge overhype, hmm. incredibly high valuations. Hmm. Everybody's sort of moving in the one direction. And then what you'll see is a rationalization of that. It'll be, you know, somebody's going to, and I, this is why I tell my friends, we have this debate about this. They're like, the, you know, they find it's the AI very spooky because yeah. it's inexplicable right now. And I'm like, you know, within the next 24 months, computer scientists are going to be able to explain exactly what's going on. Okay, good. Yeah. And when they do, we're going to, you know, we're going to lose a lot of this um, euphoria, hmm. uh, hysteria, hmm. and, uh, and we're going to get back down to business. And if you look at what happened in the, in mobile, you look what happened in the internet, you look at what happened in each one of these new platforms, there's this hugely ambitious rise in expectations. There's a rationalization. Mm. There's a quick decline as people begin to realize that it's not going to be what they thought. And then the real businesses start to emerge. Mm. And so I fully expect to see that same sort of sign curve here. Mm. I think we're right in the earliest stages of the hype part of that. And um, and I think that anybody who's going to get involved in the in the AI business, or more importantly, in any business where AI is relevant, yeah. are going to have to be prepare themselves yeah. for that solid curve yeah. of uncertainty and make sure that they are um, that they're uh, properly staffed, properly resourced, and that they're asking themselves the hard questions continually about which course they're on. That's great. That's great. So a, a next question actually on that one. So, I mean, I, I was a management consultant in New York when the dot-com bubble burst. Um, yeah. I was an equity analyst for biotech when the biotech bubble burst. Yeah, yeah. You know what my next question is? Uh, 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 <laughs> what, what's, what's the risk, given the hype and given the potential to plateau and, and given everything else, that there could be an AI bubble burst? <laughs> what are your thoughts on yeah, that? I think, so it, I, I, I'll tell you a story. In the Right about 2015, 2016, the press were always asking me and, and, and others in, this, in the venture capital industry, um, were we in a bubble? Yeah. Because if you looked at the valuations, they, there was no, you could not 
make the valuations, make sense of the valuations to the bottoms up. It was all tops down valuation. It was yeah. all based upon supply and demand of capital, not supply and demand of the product or service, mm. right? That's what was built. That's how those valuations were built. And I was, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll give you a scenario. So I would sit down with the press and the press would say, are we in a bubble? Mm. And I would go, if you are asking me if these assets are overpriced in terms of risk <laughs> yeah. analysis, yeah. the answer is yes. And they yeah. go, oh, that is really helpful. But are we in a bubble? And I would go, <laughs> you are asking me whether or not I foresee these valuations having to, to um, rationalize over time. I will say yes. And they go, oh, that's just great. But are we in a bubble? And, say, and can it burst? <laughs> <laughs> if you find a bubble yeah. by how it explodes, yeah. then I will tell you there are two scenarios here. One is it explodes. And now <laughs> you'll have the, bubble. the other is that we have enough time and, yeah. and it's a, it's a dis enough, disciplined enough process where we can come into line with real, real valuations over time without having to explode. Yeah, and there I you said, go. And I don't know which way we're going to go. Yeah. And they go, Thanks very much. So you're saying you were in a bubble. And that's, <laughs> <laughs> There's the, that, that, that's where they're performing their own analysis and, analysis and predictions. Hopefully you're right. We can escape the history of bubbles bursting and actually, as you say, start to rationalize and make sense of these things. Though it never has to happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and, yeah. and so your question was much more particular, which mm. is, um, are, will, will we have an AI bubble? My, expect, my expectation is yes. Yeah. I don't think I don't think that a lot of Main Street will be exposed to that. That will mm. be mostly, you know, a Sand Hill Road problem. Mm. And I never, you know, the idea that there's booms and busts and crashes on Sand Hill Road is part of the business. Yeah. It's part of dealing with certainty. It's mm. part of yeah. making a bet with with very little information. So I don't I don't that doesn't bother me. Mm. What bothers me is when Main Street gets pulled into it like they did in the dot com bubble. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It goes back to your initial thesis and observation from the 80s again around entrepreneurs becoming trading at traded assets and the customer being, yeah. being, the, being the investor rather than actually thinking the customer should be society longer term through yeah. great, great innovation. No, I completely agree. Totally. Um, I'm kind of aware that we're running against the clock for you and, and, and the time you've generously given to us. So can I move on to um, some of the general thoughts on on leadership and collaboration. We, we touched on a little bit at the start when you talked about how important people are when you're making investment decisions. Um, so open question again. Um, in the innovation entrepreneurship space, in, in the technology development space, um, in mapping out the future and navigating it, what, what, what is leadership for you? And what does good collaboration look like? Again, very broad question, so open yeah, to yeah. you. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a big student of leadership. And mm. I, you know, I think like many of us, I started off with this idea that there was one form of leader, you know, mm. and it was kind of a, the, uh, the, the um, cover story leader that you see in the US, the Jack Welch is, you know, probably some white middle aged guy who was outspoken and, and strong and, you know, relatively arrogant um, and uh, courageous mm. and all of those things. And through the decades, I have been disabused of that. Mm. There are many styles of leadership. There's quiet leadership. There's intellectual leadership. There's courageous leadership. I mean, you take, as an example, let's look at Zelensky for a moment. You know, in Ukraine, he had very little support prior to the war. Mm. He was failing as a peacetime president. Mm. But much like Churchill, when suddenly confronted with a, with with a with with a life or death situation for his country, he he actually found himself in exactly the role he was meant to play. Mm, yeah, yeah. And whether, and, and whether like Churchill, he gets discarded after this war is over, I don't know. But it could very well be because you need different leaders for different times. I think the most important thing to, to me about leadership is leadership needs to be genuine. Mm, yep. And it needs to be um, integral, meaning it's about the person's character. I see so many people per, um, call themselves leaders and um, essentially try to buy the support and loyalty of their people as they drive towards their own ambition versus understanding how them, themselves enough to be able to relate 
empathetically to others, hmm. to be able to communicate effectively to others, to be able to um, to subordinate their own ambitions to the ambitions of the whole and the group. These are the qualities that I think make for great leaders, hmm. not style. You yep. can be a quiet leader. You can be a boisterous leader. You can be a courageous leader. You can be a ruminative leader. But I think that genuine interest and enthusiasm for the success of the whole, for your empathy and compassion for the people you work with and appreciation, mm. and the uh, ability to, to subordinate your own personal interests to those of the organization are critical to great leadership. Great, very elegantly said. Um, love, love that, Randy. Um, so then moving to collaboration, What's your, what are your thoughts on that one? It's something our, our students are always interested in. Well, here, I, I, my model of collaboration came from my mentor, a guy named Bill Campbell, who's yeah. renowned in Silicon Valley. He's, um, there's a book written about him called The Trillion Dollar Coach. He was the coach for Steve Jobs. He was the coach for Larry and Sergey at um, at, at Google, he was the coach for Bezos at Amazon. I mean, this is, <laughs> yeah. he was a football coach before becoming executive in Silicon Valley. I was his right hand person at a number of companies. He and I were friends until his, un, un, uh, his early demise, unfortunately, about a decade ago. But um, he was a remarkable leader. Hmm. And, but he was a remarkable leader in terms of his ability to actually. Um, manage collaboration. Right. And right. what I learned from him was one of the hardest skills to actually perfect. And I can't, I can't profess to actually perfect it, but I always try. And that is the idea of how do you lead creative friction? How do you build diverse and inclusive teams where people come with different experiences, different backgrounds, different perspectives, and are able to contribute that? to a greater whole. How do you get people to listen and not fight? How do you make this not about the big, the big P politics, but the small P politics of finding common ground and being able to deal with that? And how do you as a leader make sure that this doesn't fall into endless consensus building, but rather into decision making and support for the ultimate decision of the group? This is a skill that he was remarkable at, and I will say very few people are, but to me, that's the gold standard of how you collaborate and how you lead collaboration, because it is too easy for a, you know, a, you know, just use the model, a middle-aged white male to hire middle-aged white males who look like them, went to schools like they went to school, have similar backgrounds, and then have the copacetic view around the table that eventually leads them into a disastrous business. You need that creative friction, but to do that, you need great leadership. And that's why collaboration leadership have to come together. Great, yeah. Yeah. Randy, that is wonderful. A wonderful position to uh, to be in to, to sort of um, close that session. Um, I think we've all learned so much from that. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your passion and thank you for your energy. And um, to all those who are watching, this is a pre-record, but I thank you for watching and um, thanks for being part of um, this quarter's Biz Dev at Auckland sessions. Um, we'll be returning for, for Q3. Thank you so much to everyone.